Okay, guys, let me collect those quizzes. Hope that wins pretty well. Okay, guys, I think I have all the quizzes. <clears throat> so let's get into the content for today. There were still a couple things I wanted to clean up with the Bill of Rights discussion. So we'll briefly go over this again. I liked the discussion of the Bill of Rights because it makes us reflect on the question of what is a constitution good for? Is a constitution simply about listing out all the rights that the people enjoy against their government? Or is a constitution about providing a structure, a structure of ordered liberty in which the structure itself protects the rights of the people. So remember back to Hamilton, Federalist 84, the Constitution is itself a Bill of Rights. If you care about freedom of the press, if you care about freedom of religion, the key is not to have just a list of rights at the end. The key is to design a system where those things will be protected simply because you've done a good job of structuring institutions in such a way that those liberties can't be violated. So just to make this even more clear, the example of religion. Uh, Madison, remember back to Federalist 10 and Federalist 51, he says that what protects freedom of religion is the structure of an extended republic, making a republic bigger, giving it a vast size compared to a tiny little state like Connecticut or a tiny state like Rhode Island. When you have an extended republic, what does that do to the amount of religions in it? Anyone remember? Uh, Victoria, do you remember? Yeah, you end up with more religions. And Madison says the very fact that you have more factions and more religions in the state, that's what ensures that the liberties of the people will be protected and the freedom of religion won't be violated. Madison would say, are you really trying to tell me that we're going to design a system where the Puritan New Englanders are going to be represented in the Senate, the Anglican Virginians are going to be represented in the Senate, and the Presbyterians in the southern states are going to be in the Senate, and yet they're somehow going to agree to violate freedom of religion. Uh, you know, like they, they have an interest in defending themselves, so of course they're not going to pass a law outlawing freedom of religion. That's what protects freedom of religion, according to Madison, not so much a First Amendment that says freedom of religion can't be violated. But it's not only that the Bill of Rights is unnecessary, it's also that it's dangerous, right? So anti-federalists say you must have these guarantees, you must have these rights listed down where no one can possibly say that they're not important. But the federalists say that's actually monarchy that you're drawing from. In monarchies, the king gives rights to his people as a gift. This is what happened with the Magna Carta. This is what happened with the English Petition of Right and the English Bill of Rights. The king basically throws up his hands and says, well, I'm agreeing not to violate these rights, but I reserve all the other political power to myself. The assumption, the default way of thinking is that the king is ultimately sovereign, the government in other words, is sovereign, and the government decides what rights are guaranteed to the people. Hamilton suggests that if you bring in this Bill of Rights stuff, you're bringing that same assumption into our republic, and you're perverting the very purpose of a constitution, because actually the purpose of a constitution is not to just lay down the rights that government must guarantee. The purpose of the constitution is to create that free structure uh, that institutional structure that leaves the people free to order themselves. Uh, and so one thing that Hamilton stresses is that you want us to say, government, you can't violate freedom of the press. But nothing in the Constitution says it can. So why should we lay down that you can't do this? Uh, Hamilton says the negative side effect of this would be that all of a sudden, 
if something isn't listed in the Bill of Rights, the government can say, well, that means I can do it, right? Because you guys didn't lay this down as something we can't do in the Bill of Rights. So for example, this isn't what the First Amendment says, but let's just say for the sake of argument, it says this. If they included freedom of religion as a fundamental right in the Bill of Rights, but left out freedom of speech, the government could say, well, you know, as long as I don't touch religion, that's fine, but I can do whatever I want to speech. And Hamilton says, no, that's a complete perversion of what constitutional government means. Because in a constitutional republic, the people are sovereign, not the government, not the king. And the people give government powers. The people decide, here's what government can do. Here's what it can't do. And if the people don't give the government the power, for example, uh, like so in the Constitution, the Congress has the power to coin money and to raise taxes for the general welfare. But if the people didn't give them a power, then the assumption should be that the government can't do it. So a Bill of Rights is dangerous because it'll shift us into thinking that the government can do anything that we don't list out as something it can't do. Well, the framers eventually give up on this fight. Uh, you know, the framers didn't like the idea. They didn't want a Bill of Rights. But they make this concession. And I like this because this concession actually says something to us about the framers' emphasis on moderation and compromise. So the framers, as we mentioned at the Constitutional Convention discussion, the framers are always thinking, how do we get as many people on board with this constitution as possible. We want a constitution that the free states like, that the slave states like, that the small states like, that the large states like. It doesn't matter whether the most, uh, it doesn't whether, it doesn't matter if a majority of the people is all that likes it. Uh, we want as many people to like it, not just 51%. Well, they sign on to a Bill of Rights for much the same reason. They're thinking, you know, we think this is unnecessary. We even think it's dangerous. But if this is the main thing that the anti-federalists are worried about, then we're going to try to meet them halfway on this because we think that it's more important to bring in those anti-federalists and satisfy as many people with this constitution. Uh, it's more important to do that than it is to give up on or uh, to not include a Bill of Rights for principled reasons. Yeah, Micah. Was that you ever thrown around to like put it somewhere in the Bill of Rights, or maybe it is mentioned, or maybe it is, but, um, that the government, like limiting the government on things that are considered a document? Yeah, so you're actually, yeah, great job, Seth. So, which amendments solve this problem? The yeah, and there's also one right before it, too, that does the same thing. The Ninth and Tenth Amendment, these are companion amendments that actually are meant to kind of get the framers out of that problem, the theoretical problem that they're pointing out. So the Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration of these rights in the Bill of Rights cannot be construed in such a way that it's, in, it's seen that these are the only rights that the people have. So the framers in the Ninth Amendment just preempt that argument that, well, if it's, the people must not have these rights if it's not in the Bill. They say in the Ninth Amendment, we're listing these rights out, but that doesn't mean that there's not other rights too. The Tenth Amendment deals with the problem of the enumerated powers, because as you suggested, Seth, it says that any powers that are not given to the federal government are left to the states and to the people. So the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are meant to kind of solve this theoretical problem that the framers were thinking about. Of course, critics of the Bill of Rights would say the only reason the Ninth and Tenth Amendment even become necessary is because you have the first eight amendments that perhaps imperil uh, you know, our understanding of delegated and enumerated powers. Yeah. Seth and then uh, Calliope. Did they ever have the idea to just do like a Ninth and Tenth Amendment, like just have those two kind of like add on to the end? Um, well, I don't think they thought of only doing that because the very reason, I think most framers thought the Ninth and Tenth Amendment would just be assumed because it's implicit in the nature of a constitution that the people create these powers, but all the other powers are reserved to the other units. Um, so I, I don't think that idea was pitched. That's a good question. I don't really know. Uh, Calliope?
Uh, so what's the question? The right to privacy and right to an abortion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think some people try to make the case that the right to an abortion is one of those Ninth Amendment, like it's not listed, but you have it. Some people try to do that, but I think the more common argument that liberal and left wing people make is the the First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech and these kinds of freedoms. They actually have implicit within them a much more general freedom of expression, a much more general right to privacy, even uh, like the right to privacy, even though it's not mentioned in the Bill of Rights at all. Uh, Justice William Douglas in Griswold versus Connecticut, the one that lays the foundation for Roe versus Wade a few years later, he says, well, the right to privacy, it flows from the penumbras and emanations of the Bill of Rights. So, you know, he's interpreting the spirit of the Bill of Rights rather than anything that's actually in the words. Um, but yeah, some people definitely have tried to say, well, in the Ninth Amendment, it says people have other rights too, so why can't abortion rights be one of those things? Um, but the problem I think you would run into if you tried to say Roe versus Wade is right using that is because the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments were states' rights amendments, right? So the whole purpose of those amendments was to clarify that the federal government is not ultimately the author of rights. And if rights are reserved to the people, then it's the state governments that have to handle it. Uh, the 10th Amendment and the 9th Amendment, they should be seen as companion amendments. Yeah, well, that's, that's very controversial. It's been controversial ever since the government has done it. Because the Bill of Rights was originally meant to restrict the federal government from doing things. But the Supreme Court has used the 14th Amendment in uh, they, they basically taken the 14th Amendment, which guarantees to every person that life, liberty and property will be protected, due process will be protected, equal protection under the law. Uh, the 14th Amendment guarantees these things. And this has been used by the Supreme Court to say, well, if no state can restrict life, liberty, or property, well, we get to define what liberty is. The Supreme Court does. And we think liberty includes this right to an abortion. And so the 14th Amendment has been used in conjunction with the Bill of Rights to actually stop the state governments from doing things. So for example, the First Amendment, freedom of religion, that's invoked to take prayer out of schools, to take nativity scenes out of public schools even though the whole purpose of the Bill of Rights was to leave the states free to decide what they wanted to do for religion with themselves. Uh, so the Bill of Rights has been radically perverted from what it was supposed to do. And I think many of the Federalists would look at that and say, we told you so, right? I mean, we told you that a Bill of Rights might have some of these adverse consequences that maybe you anti-Federalists are not considering. So this point here, uh, you know, perhaps the Bill of Rights, even though the intention and even though the actual application of the Bill of Rights was pretty much okay until the 14th Amendment, uh, it's possible that having in it in the Constitution this Bill of Rights, it might move the emphasis in the public mind away from the powers that government can legitimately exercise, which is the main concern that the framers have at the convention. And it might move the emphasis more to this question of what rights must the government guarantee? And that's a question that, I mean, it's definitely a, a major question in political life, what rights government should guarantee to you. But at the same time, this is something that has been kind of toxic to the idea of states' rights, right? Um, for better or worse, we might sometimes say that's good. For example, Jim Crow, uh, you know, some... Southern segregation has said, well, it's our state's right to decide what we want to do with the rights of Black people, and you, federal government, you can't stop us. But then on the other hand, abortion rights, you know, that's an example in the opposite direction where the federal government guarantees that we're going to protect individual rights to abortion, even though the vast majority of states don't want this. Out of curiosity, any guesses? How many of our 50 states, uh, uh, so how many of our 50 states when Roe versus Wade was laid down in 1973, how many of them had abortion on demand? 
three. So Roe versus Wade repealed, like it basically destroyed the laws of 47 of our states. Um, so 47 states, they had varying laws. Some states had more restrictions for things like rape and incest, but there was no state except for three, Alaska, New York, and um, can't even remember the other one, but uh, Alaska and New York and one other state, they had abortion on demand, but only three states. So Roe versus Wade basically nationalizes an issue and puts the most radical policy in place that 47 states oppose. Uh, and they do this using a perverse understanding of the Bill of Rights, right? So the Bill of Rights, the right to privacy flows out of the penumbras and emanations of the, the Constitution, whatever that means, right? Um, and uh, so this is something we can think about, and it's actually related to Lincoln. So we need to get into Lincoln. Um, but it's related to Lincoln, and that's why I like to do Lincoln after the Bill of Rights, because the 14th Amendment, which I've mentioned several times now, that's the key amendment in understanding how the Bill of Rights goes from being this thing that stops the federal government from acting and is actually turned into something that the federal government actually uses against the states. So now the Bill of Rights is actually something that has paradoxically empowered the federal government, because now the Supreme Court can use the Bill of Rights to say, you've got to take your prayer out of schools, you little city council in Massachusetts or in some other state. Uh, you've got to just strip that out. Uh, we, and we say so, because we define what the Bill of Rights means. We define what the 14th Amendment means. And before, in the early republic, that never could have happened on, without the 14th Amendment. It turns out the 14th Amendment, that comes out of Lincoln's war. Um, it comes out of the Civil War. It comes out of Lincoln's understanding of the Union, his understanding of equality. The 14th Amendment is in some ways the culmination of Lincoln's ideas, uh, even though he did not live to see its passage in 1868. He's still a key player in understanding how we get there, uh, how do we get to the 14th Amendment, which changes completely the game about the Bill of Rights. One thing I did want to say about the Bill of Rights uh, regarding one of the advantages of it, and this is an advantage that James Madison is eventually convinced by. So he's initially on the team that says we don't need one. But Madison comes around to thinking that maybe it's valuable to have a Bill of Rights as a kind of educational uh, as, a, as something that educates the people about the rights that they should hold dear. So if you have a list of rights in your constitution that are always before you and that the citizens are always familiar with, then these are rights that they're going to believe are fundamental to living in a free country. So freedom of speech and freedom of religion. It's good to not just assume that those things are valuable, but it's good to put right there in the words of the document, the these things are sacrosanct, that these things are foundational to living in a free republic. And so people like Madison, they came around to thinking, well, maybe the Bill of Rights, it can, it can educate citizens to understanding what rights are valuable, what rights are foundational in a republic. And so maybe it has a positive educational function. <clears throat> so that's the last word on the Bill of Rights. Um, so another point I should mention, before we get into our readings for today. So Lincoln, we've been spending all of our time discussing the American founding, uh, the doctrines of the founders, uh, their understanding of republicanism, their understanding of the constitution. And next week, we're going to be moving into a new unit. We're going to be moving into the progressives. And you're going to see the progressives make the case against the founders. The progressives argue against the doctrines of the founding. Well, Lincoln is kind of a transitional figure, and he's interesting in that respect. He's someone that's uh, not a member of the founding generation, but he's not a progressive really either. But he, in some ways, has a foot in both waters, uh, as we are going to learn. He's been interpreted in radically different ways by different people. Uh, to some conservatives, Lincoln is basically uh, someone that should be seen as equivalent to the founders. Uh, he's just like them. Uh, he agrees with all of their same values. 
I'm even familiar with someone who uh, celebrates Lincoln's, like he has a birthday, he has a birthday party for Lincoln every year on February 12th, where he has a birthday cake and candles and sings the happy birthday song with his family. That's how much he loves Lincoln. You got to have a birthday party for a guy that's been dead for over 150 years. Is that a good idea? Should we do that? Want to have a birthday party? And uh, Lincoln, so there are some people that have this nearly uh, almost cultic uh, love of Lincoln. But then there are some conservatives that have the complete opposite viewpoint, right? Where people think, you know, things were pretty good until Lincoln came along. He messed it up. He's the guy that really is where America went wrong. And in fairness to these conservatives, they're not usually emphasizing something like, oh, well, he was nice to black Americans and that's why he's bad. Like they're they're not usually racist arguing this. These are serious people. And they they argue that Lincoln changed the nature of the union. He made the federal government much more powerful than it was supposed to be. So that's one negative view of Lincoln. And then the progressives, early progressives like Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, they said, Lincoln's one of our own. We love this guy because he believed in a powerful federal government that was devoted to equality. That's what we want. We want equality for all people. And so some progressives celebrated Lincoln as a great defender of equality and a powerful national government. More recently, some progressives are actually attacking Lincoln, uh, saying that he's perhaps not, not as much of a believer in equality as he should be. Um, there's a book by a very left-wing scholar that came out recently, and it's called Lincoln's White Dream. And it's basically about how everything Lincoln did was about purifying the nation for white people. They didn't really care about black people in any fundamental way. So Lincoln's, the views of Lincoln, they're all over the place, right? I mean, uh, there, there are some conservatives that love the guy, some conservatives who hate him, progressives who love him, progressives who hate him. And this is because of the ambiguity of Lincoln. So here's something I will say that clearly makes Lincoln very different from the progressives, and perhaps just means he's not a progressive at all. Uh, Lincoln is similar to the founders in one important respect. It's his belief in human nature, his belief in natural law, and the idea that there are permanent, eternal moral standards that govern human beings. So we should remember the Federalist Papers, Federalist 51. It says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Uh, and he says that politics is the greatest of all reflections on human nature. That's Federalist 51. The, the framers are always thinking, what do we do to, to uh, make a government that's in line with the weaknesses, but also the strengths of a fixed human nature, a human nature that doesn't change over time? Hamilton at the Constitutional Convention, he says, the science of politics is the science of human nature. And the framers also believed that connected with this idea that human nature doesn't change, the framers also believed morality doesn't change. They believed that there are permanent moral standards that guide human beings, that men need to live by. So remember back to George Washington and George Washington's praise of religion in the circular letter. Uh, Washington, he famously said that there is, an in, there is an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness, between duty and advantage, and no nation can expect the smiles of heaven to smile upon it if it disregards those rules of right and propriety which heaven itself has ordained for it. So God gives us moral laws that we need to follow. These laws don't change over time. Lincoln's on that same team, basically. Uh, Lincoln, he says in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates that the real battle over slavery is the same battle between eternal right and wrong. Uh, it's, he says, the real division over slavery is the eternal struggle between right and wrong in the world. So there's an eternal struggle between right and wrong. And the battle over slavery is just the latest manifestation of this. Slavery is wrong. He says, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. Uh, Lincoln, he makes many powerful moral arguments against slavery that I think the founders would agree with. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I quoted his notes on the state of Virginia and some of his 
dark reflections on the institution of slavery. Uh, Lincoln, I think, agrees with those. Lincoln says that slavery should be banned because we believe in the golden rule. Because just as I would not be a slave, I would not want to be a master. And the golden rule, it says, do unto others. So if you wouldn't want to be a slave, why would you ever want to enslave someone else? So Lincoln, he makes, he makes moral arguments against slavery that I think reflects something of the principles of the founders, natural law, eternal moral standards. And we're going to see next week, starting next week, that the progressives, they explicitly reject these things. Uh, the progressives like Woodrow Wilson, they make the case that morality progresses, uh, morality changes. Um, you know, uh, Woodrow Wilson, in one of his books, he says, law follows standards of policy only and not absolute standards of right and wrong. And so we got to move away from this moral foundationalism. Uh, we've got to move away from the idea that morality is fixed and unchanging. Lincoln's not on that progressive team. But he is something, he is similar to the progressives in one other respect. So if he disagrees with them on morality and human nature, there is something that the progressives like about him that they pick up on. And that's that Lincoln, he's very much a believer in a powerful federal government. He moves the emphasis away from states' rights permanently. And he also suggests that the purpose of the nation is to promote and protect the principle of equality. And in fairness to Lincoln, he's not understanding equality in a kind of Marxist way or anything like that, or even in a radical progressive way. Like he's not talking about a powerful welfare state that gives money to everyone to equalize the board completely. That's not what he's really talking about. But some people, including some of the progressives say, well, Lincoln, he got as much equality as he could do. And we're just moving forward. We're, we also believe that in the proposition that all men are created equal, we want to realize that. So he makes the federal government more powerful. And he talks a lot about equality. These are things that progressives end up liking. So he's not really a progressive, but I'm going to suggest in this lecture that he's not really purely dedicated to the principles of the founding either. Uh, he probably thought he was, but I do think there are clear tensions between some of his ideas about the union, especially the nature of the federal union and the ideas of the framers. So I'm going to suggest that even though he likes the founders and even though he's actually in line with the founders in a lot of ways, is it possible that maybe he understands the founders in a way that they did not actually understand themselves? Perhaps he interprets them in a way that is convenient for his own agenda. We'll have to consider that today. So who is this guy? Well, he's born in Kentucky, which is a state that's on the frontier. It's kind of on the outskirts of the more civilized states in the Union, the states in like Virginia and New England, the states that are much more settled. They've been there for a long period of time. Kentucky is kind of in the middle of nowhere at this time. It doesn't have a lot of people in there. And Lincoln comes from a, a very uh, humble beginning. Uh, he's, he's from a home where his dad was a farmer, uh, a very pretty much a low class or a lower middle class kind of farmer. And Lincoln didn't like it. Lincoln did not like this frontier culture. He didn't like his father's humble beginnings. Uh, he thought that his father lacked ambition. There's actually a very good book about Lincoln entitled Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln. And it's by a guy named Richard Brookheiser. And one thing that Brookheiser mentions in that book is that Lincoln really had a kind of indifference to his own father. Uh, Lincoln did not identify with his father very much. He didn't really like him even. Uh, his father, he thought, he didn't want to better himself. He was happy being a kind of middle-class farmer that stayed out of the way of other people and who was okay living in the middle of nowhere. And Lincoln thinks that's not what civilized life is about. I believe in ambition. I don't want to be a farmer. I want to be a railroad lawyer. I want to be a president of the United States. 
Um, I want to do something with my life. My dad never did that. Uh, so that's kind of Lincoln's attitude. Um, you know, he thinks that in a, in a weird way, the book is called Founder's Son because Lincoln, he's reading all these books about George Washington and Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson. And Brookheiser suggests that perhaps Lincoln saw them almost as surrogate fathers. Um, he had more of a solidarity, more of a affinity for the founders than he did his own father. Uh, so that's that's a very fascinating aspect of his early life. Well, this is connected to his rise to politics. He becomes a Whig, a Whig congressman. And we don't need to get into the details of the Whigs versus the Democrats. Some of you may have had U.S. history with Dr. Stewart. Have any of you had it? Uh-huh. Has he talked about the Whigs at all yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. So not yet. But um, in any case, the Whig party, it's not a surprise at all that Lincoln would gravitate to that party because the Whig party was about free enterprise. Uh, it was about industrialism. It was about business. It was about economic advancement. Um, it was not about just being content with being a kind of a farmer. Uh, it wanted to diversify the economy. We wanted more businesses. We wanted more commerce. We don't just want farmers. That was what the Whigs felt. And so Lincoln joins that party. And he's not a congressman for very long. You can see he's only in Congress for two years before he, he leaves. And it's not until slavery comes onto the scene that Lincoln really has his feet to the fire to get back into politics. He had wanted to retire from political life, but the new rise of the slavery issue that propels him into the Republican Party, which was a new party at this time, and he wants to totally change. He, wa he wants to take, he wants to do something about slavery. That's a huge issue for him. He's an interesting guy compared to other Republicans on the slavery issue. Lincoln is actually a moderate Republican on slavery. So I've mentioned that he had very profound moral arguments against slavery. He really did believe it's wrong. I really want us to appreciate that about Lincoln. You know, I do think that he was sincerely opposed to slavery. Uh, I don't think he believed it was moral in any way. But Lincoln was not as radical on the issue as some other Northerners were. There was a fellow by the name of William Lloyd Garrison who famously said the constitution is a pact with the devil and a deal with hell, right? And he actually organized bonfires where people would throw the constitution in a fire. And Garrison believed this thing is a deal with the devil because look, this thing has a fugitive slave clause in it. It protects slavery. So the constitution is evil. Um, is the attitude of William Lloyd Garrison. That's not Lincoln. Lincoln does not agree with these radicals that are talking about uh, even violence to end slavery. So John Brown and the Harper's Fair, uh, the, the raid on Harper's Ferry, organized by a radical abolitionist, um, you know, who wants to end slavery through violent methods. That's not Lincoln. He really believes in the rule of law on this issue. But Lincoln, he wants to end slavery. And he thinks the only way to do that is through a kind of gradual, a slow and incremental approach to the problem. Uh, you can't just pass a law in the Congress and say slavery is now outlawed. Uh, he, he doesn't think you can do that. Uh, not only because the South wouldn't accept it, but also just because he does recognize that's probably not constitutional. You'd have to amend the constitution to outlaw slavery, which eventually happens in the wake of the Civil War. So he comes back into politics because Kansas, Nebraska, uh, the Kansas, Nebraska Act and the Dred Scott decision, we don't need to get into the details of what those things are, except in so far as I mentioned that these things are basically things that Lincoln sees as pro-slavery federal policy. So all of a sudden, the federal government is actively protecting slavery in a way that it wasn't before. And he says, this means the federal government has come under the control of a group of pro-slavery radicals. And 
we have to stop this. So that's kind of Lincoln's attitude about why he gets in. Interestingly, Lincoln is not someone who runs a campaign that's that radical, right? So I, I mentioned his moderation on slavery. And in 1860, he's chosen in by the Republican Party because he is seen as someone that could win. Uh, he's seen as someone that's not crazy, uh, like some of the other candidates, like John Fremont was in 1856. <clears throat> but even though Lincoln runs as a pretty moderate guy, uh, he says, I don't want to touch slavery in the South, but I do want to stop it from spreading. So that's basically Lincoln's position is we can stop slavery here in these gray territories. Slavery can be destroyed there by an act of Congress because territories are owned by the federal government. Uh, and this is still true today, by the way, like Puerto Rico is a territory. Um, it's not a state. It doesn't have senators representing it in the Senate. Uh, so it doesn't have the same sovereign rights that a state does. But Lincoln thinks that if you're a territory, Congress can pass a law that basically decides what you're going to do with slavery. And Lincoln thinks we can ban slavery there. We can kind of contain slavery. We can contain slavery to the states where it already exists in the South, but we can also keep it from spreading into these territories. And that's his approach. Uh, slavery, it needs. we need to stop the spread, uh, but we can't touch it in the states where it already exists. Well, even though that's Lincoln's approach, and even though that approach is not that radical really, um, the South is scared half to death whenever he's elected. And the Southern argument is that this is, this is the first candidate ever who won the presidency on an actively anti-slavery platform. Um, you know, this is the, so there were many presidents, probably even most presidents that had the idea that slavery was probably morally wrong in some vague sense. But no president ever made it a matter of policy to put slavery on the road to extinction in the way that Lincoln did. And the South says, well, if that's the kind of president that you guys are going to elect, and by the way, you elected him without us, how many Southern states does Lincoln carry? None, right? So he doesn't win a single Southern state. And he wasn't even on the ballot in some of these Southern states. And so the South is thinking, we have a candidate who's actively anti-slavery and he can win the White House without us. Um, and so this means that we're going to be permanently marginalized in the federal government. We won't be as important as we used to be. That's the Southern fear. Um, you know, but of course, one thing that undercuts that fear is that the, the reason the South lost the election is probably their own fault in some ways. I mean, they there was a split up, there was a breakup you know, we're unhappy to hear that on Valentine's Day, right? But there was a breakup between the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats. And of course, the breakup was over what issue? Any ideas? Slavery, right? Like, so the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats, they end up fighting. Uh, they end up running their own candidates. So you have John Breckinridge, the Southern Democrat. And he thinks that Stephen Douglas, who's the Northern Democrat, who probably would have won the election had it only been one Democratic front. Um, you know, Stephen Douglas was seen as not being pro-slavery enough by the by the Southerners. And so there's a there's kind of a split in the Democratic Party, which would have probably won the election. And that's what makes possible Lincoln's victory. The other candidate. You don't need to know this for anything, but the other candidate who won these three states, he was a guy na named John Bell. Uh, he was he pretty much was a unionist that wanted to push slavery out like, you know, slavery. That should not be an issue that is not on the table. So just push slavery to the side and try to save the union without it. Um, you know, so America is hopelessly divided in 1860 and Lincoln wins and what the South does in response. They leave the Union. They secede from the Union, a threat that had been made going all the way back to the early days of the Republic. 
whenever New England threatened to secede from the Union during the War of 1812. Finally, we've actually seen a state secede. And what this means is that the state withdraws from the Union. It withdraws from the federal government. So practically speaking, this means that if you're a state and you have had a secession convention and your state has decided to leave the Union, then your state no longer is going to send senators to Washington. It no longer will send electors to the presidential electoral college. It no longer is going to enforce any federal legislation, uh, any federal laws that were passed by the Union. And so the states break away and try to assert that they are sovereign nations, uh, basically. They're, they're sovereign states that don't have to stay within this federal union. That's what secession is. Lincoln tries to bring these states back by trying to just reiterate that his position is not that crazy, even for a Southerner that likes slavery. So Lincoln, he writes a letter to a guy named Alexander Stevens, who had been an old friend in Congress. Um, Seth, would you mind reading this letter, the, le the one to Stevens? Yes. Do the people of the South really entertain fears that a Republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves or with them about their slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you as once a friend and still, I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fear. Yeah, so he's admitting right there, you know, like, you guys are losing your cool for no reason. I don't want to touch slavery in the Southern states. That's not my agenda. I want to stop slavery from spreading, but I'm not trying to say that I as president can just take your slaves away from you in the South. Um, so that's his position to Alexander Stevens, who actually goes on to be the vice president of the Confederacy, right? So he, he became vice president of the Confederate States. In the first inaugural address, Lincoln reiterates this position. He says, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. So he admits it would be illegal for me to stop slavery in the South. That's not what I'm after. Yeah, Gavin? He said that his plan was to like, stop the spread of it by mm -hmm. outlawing it in the uh, territory, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that mean that should those territories become yes, that yeah. they would be outnumbered in the Senate? Yes, so... absolutely. So that, that's actually exactly the Southern worry, is that they're thinking, whatever you're saying about your position on slavery in the short term, we know the real implication of what this is going to mean for us. So as soon as these become states, Lincoln has said in one of his famous speeches, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We must be either all free or all slave. We cannot be both. We cannot have some slave states and some free states. We have to be unified. And so that is a principled reason to purge slavery from the whole nation, not just in the territories. And the South is thinking exactly what you're saying, Gavin, that as soon as these territories become states in their own right, you might be able to just circumvent Southern resistance to a constitutional amendment. You, this, you might actually have two thirds of the states in the Senate and also in the ratifying the, the state legislatures that would need to approve amendments. So you could potentially have a 13th amendment without the South agreeing to it. That's kind of what the South is thinking. They're thinking, you know, it's not just your presidency. It's what your presidency is symbolizing. It's what your presidency is going to put us on the road to. And to the South, the idea of a world without slavery was just not a world they wanted to consider. Unfortunately, I'd say. So Lincoln, he's always about the Union, right? Um, so he stressed his moderation on the question of slavery. And in another place, he makes it very clear what his priority is. He says, if there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is, it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. 
And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save this union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the union. So at the end of the day, what's important to him is saving the union. We've got to stop secession, not because slavery is evil and we've got to punish the Southern states for having it. We've got to stop secession because we have to save the union from being destroyed. Uh, one thing he's, he talks about is that the federal government has accrued debts um, that the Southern states have agreed to. Um, so think about this. If you're uh, so, so Congress, which for 90 years had had both Southern and Northern states, and some Southern states had voted in favor of certain things like internal improvement spending in Southern regions. And these are debts that the federal government has had to pay, and it, they've had to do it because Southern states wanted them. But now the Southern states are going to leave the Union, and this means that that money can't be paid anymore. Uh, so is that fair? Lincoln asks. Now, that's the kind of thing that could hypothetically be worked out in the same way that this was worked out when the United States seceded from Britain, right? I mean, this could have been Britain's argument, too, at that time. Um, but his more profound argument, and the argument I want us to really think about, is Lincoln's constitutional argument. Uh, this is where it gets spicy. Uh, this is where it gets scandalous. Right. Um, so Lincoln, he says a lot of things in this special session message. I want to focus especially on that right now. He's making the case in the special session message that secession is illegal. And to make that case, he has to really make he, he really has to make a persuasive case that the Constitution prohibits secession. Whether he succeeds or not, I will I will suggest my own opinion, but leave you to make your own decision. But we have to understand what his argument is before we evaluate it. In the first place, there's a very striking passage in the special session message. I hope you noticed it and took some note of it, where Lincoln really goes after the idea of state sovereignty, uh, the idea that any states reserve sovereignty to themselves under the Constitution. Lincoln says, Whence this magical omnipotence of state rights, asserting a claim of power to lawfully destroy the Union itself? Much is said about the sovereignty of the states, but the word even is not in the national constitution, nor as is believed in any of the state constitutions. What is a sovereignty in the political sense of the term? Would it be far wrong to define it as a political community without a political superior? Tested by this, no one of our states except Texas ever was a sovereignty, and even Texas gave up that character on coming into the Union. So this stuff about state sovereignty is baloney. Uh, you know, no states were ever sovereign, with the possible exception of Texas, which, uh, are any of you from Texas? Yeah, so what's the big interesting thing about Texas? Um, we got our independence from Mexico. Uh -huh. Yeah, you were the Republic of Texas, and you fought what Texans consistently tell me is the most important battle in human history, right? The Alamo. I'm just, I'm just, that is an awesome battle, actually, but uh, it is funny. The te Texans have a very strong understanding of their, their identity, which I love, actually. But um, yeah, so Lincoln concedes maybe Texas, which was a Republic of Texas before it came into the Union, maybe that had some sovereignty. But as soon as you came into the Union, you lost it. That's it. Well, of course, all of the states were at one point sovereign nations. Uh, you know, all of the states were claimed in the Articles of Confederation to reserve their total sovereignty and independence. And how can the states reserve their sovereignty if they never had it, is what someone might say. So you're saying that in the Articles of Confederation, the sovereignty of the states is recognized and guaranteed, but we, but that sovereignty doesn't exist. Um, you know, so 
this is a problem Lincoln runs into, is that it does seem clear that the states had some sovereignty. So how does he make this argument? His argument depends upon his idea that the union created the states, not the other way around, right? So he doesn't think that the states created the union, which in some ways is a very radical argument, I'd say. Um, it's a very strange argument, even. The union is older than any of the states, and it, in fact, created them as states. So trying to unpack this. If you're someone like Rufus Choate, that's not a name you need to know, but he was a critic of Lincoln from the North. He was a Whig. He was a Whig congressman, Whig senator from Massachusetts. And someone like Rufus Choate would say, what are you talking about? Um, my people were here in the 1600s before there was ever a union, before there was ever a declaration of independence. My ancestors were Puritans that settled Massachusetts and they were pilgrims that settled the Plymouth colony and they created communities. They created the community of Massachusetts and eventually that community joined with the other states and created the union of states under the Articles of Association, and then the Articles of Confederation, and then finally the Constitution. And so how can you, Lincoln, say the states were created by the Union, by the national government for all intents and purposes? Um, you know, like he's, he's suggesting that at the end of the day, the states have no, no real sovereignty at all. We've talked a lot about a C word. So there's a C word that the anti-federalists and even many of the federalists complained about in relation to the union. What were the anti-federalists so worried the framers were doing with the constitution? Yeah, Calliope. Consolidation. Lincoln is arguing for that, basically. Like he's suggesting that the union was a consolidated union. He even goes so far as to say that the states are analogous to counties. Right, he makes that argument that, well, you know, secession is really the same in principle as a county leaving a state government behind. And where do you stop with this principle? Well, the problem with that, if you're someone that emphasizes state sovereignty, is that the counties are not sovereign, but the states do have sovereign rights. So, for example, in the early republic and under the original constitutional uh, set of assumptions, state sovereignty is guaranteed by the Senate. Right, so the Senate of the United States guarantees state sovereignty by giving the states an equality with one another, by allowing the state governments to choose representatives, senators to represent them at the federal level. And state sovereignty is also recognized in smaller scale ways, like the fact that states can raise their own militias. States, you know, they have a uh, they have their own elections that the federal government can't necessarily supervise in every way. Well, that's not the same as a county. So counties in the states, these can be destroyed, they can be changed at will if the the state government capital wants to change it. Uh, counties cannot raise their own militias. They don't have sovereign rights, sovereign guarantees. But Lincoln just says to heck with that. That stuff doesn't matter because no state ever had any sovereignty. State sovereignty doesn't exist. And that's why the union is sacrosanct. That's why the union cannot be destroyed. What do you think is a good response to this objection? The, the word sovereignty is not in the constitution. So it must not be, so states can't be sovereign. You know, like if, if the states were sovereign, why didn't the constitution say so? How do you think someone like William Davy or James Madison might respond? Yeah, Gavin? Is it implied that there's still some sovereignty in the states? Like the existence of the Senate or the electoral college? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that clearly points in that direction. The Senate doesn't make any sense um, in, in principle, unless the states still reserve sovereignty to themselves. And I'd also point to the Tenth Amendment, which was not necessary to believe this, but the 10th Amendment codifies it very clearly. The 10th Amendment says all powers not delegated to the federal government by the states are reserved to the states or to the people. Well, unpacking that and what that means, if the states are delegating powers to the federal government, who comes first? Is it the states or the federal union? 
if the states are giving the powers to the federal union, right? That's what the 10th Amendment explicitly says, right? And so, I mean, Lincoln, he's he's doing some kind of interesting things here with the Constitution. And he's arguably changing the understanding of the union into consolidation, basically. So he's saying states don't have sovereignty. States don't have rights. I mean, we might give them certain privileges and certain rights because it's convenient to do so. But in principle, the states have no more sovereignty than a county does. That's a pretty extreme argument. And so I would suggest that Lincoln is ultimately arguing for consolidation. And he's trying to make people think that the union created a consolidated union. <clears throat> I didn't bring the handout with me, but the William Richardson Davy reading, uh, there's some interesting stuff in that that relates to this. So Davy, he says, uh, he was a framer of the Constitution, by the way. Like he's at the convention, he's voting on important things. And William Davy, he says, of course the states are sovereign because look at what we've done with the Senate. And he says, there's a massive check on the federal government getting out of control because if the federal government gets out of control, the states can blow it up by not sending senators. The states can blow it up by not sending electors to choose the president. So the states ultimately have that trump on the federal government is they can just not send senators, they can not send electors to the electoral college. Well, that's secession. That's basically what secession is, is the states no longer sending senators, no longer sending electors. And William Davy, who was a framer, he said, oh, of course that's okay. Um, you know, if as a last resort, it's not something you should rush into, but that's okay. And if it wasn't explicit enough there, there are actually writings from many of the founding fathers when New England was talking about secession in the 1810s. And many of the framers said, of course, New England can secede under the Constitution. So Lincoln is really doing something kind of uh, unique here. So really quick, I want to talk about the Gettysburg Address, because that's intimately connected with his view of the Union. Uh, the Gettysburg Address is really a, a wonderful speech. I mean, it's a beautiful speech. I, I, I'm critical of Lincoln's constitutional thought in some ways, but I do want to really hammer in on the fact that he was a very gifted orator. Um, he was a beautiful speaker. Uh, he had a very powerful way of arranging his words in, in a way that has inspired generations for, or inspired people for many generations. And Lincoln, the Gettysburg Address is the embodiment of Lincoln's talent for rhetoric. Uh, Lincoln, he wants to use this occasion where he's speaking about the, the Union Army that has died at Gettysburg. It's a cemetery dedication, right? So the cemetery is being dedicated at this battlefield where a great war, a great war battle took place. And Lincoln, he doesn't really talk a lot about the dead soldiers, right? He talks about the highest ideals that he thinks inspired the dead soldiers. And in doing so, he really tries to provide his own definition about the meaning of the war. What does this war mean for us? And I think that when most people think about the Civil War, they think of it in the terms that Lincoln laid down for them in the Gettysburg Address, more so than maybe what the average soldier thought. Um, I mean, do you, do you think that the average soldier of the Union Army was thinking about the proposition that all men are created equal is the main thing that moved them? I mean, probably not, right? Um, you know, there are good books on this that let you read the diaries of Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers, and most of them emphasize things like family and, you know, I'm fighting to save the Union. Um, you know, the, you know, America... It's been America in all my life, and I don't ever want to see that change. I don't want to see it change by a Southern exodus from the Union. But Lincoln says that the Union is about equality. So he's already redefined the nature of the Union by saying that basically states have no sovereignty under the Constitution. Uh, at the end of the day, the federal government is sovereign, uh, which pretty much neutralizes the idea of states' rights as something that is essential and meaningful in the constitutional tradition. 
And now he is explaining what does the federal government need to promote? And according to Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address, it needs to promote equality. The proposition that all men are created equal. So he's he's trying to dedicate ourselves to this idea because he thinks that's the way we can find a moral purpose in this suffering, a moral purpose in these great battles that we fought. It needs to be about something more than just saving the Union. Uh, that, that was what Lincoln wanted, but he's emphasizing that saving the Union is a means to promote the principle that all men are created equal. <clears throat> And Lincoln believes this because of his interesting interpretation of the relationship between the Declaration of Independence, which talks about all men are created equal, and the Constitution, which, does that say all men are created equal in the Constitution? Yes or no? No. Yeah, there's there's nothing about equality in the original Constitution. Um, you know, the preamble... We ordain and establish this constitution to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity and establish justice and create a, a, uh, a better union. Uh, you know, those are kind of the aims of the constitution, according to the preamble. Nothing really about equality there. Uh, so Lincoln, he says, well, actually, the constitution is subordinate to the, to the declaration. There's a sense in which they're even fused, right? Um, so the Declaration, that's the real heart of what America means. All men are created equal. All men are endowed by their creator with natural rights. That's the heart of the Declaration. And that's the heart of the American political tradition. The Constitution is valuable insofar as it allows us to realize that goal. And so that's the significance of the Gettysburg Address, is Lincoln is really doing a good job of a uh, placing equality front and center in the federal government's agenda in a way that perhaps it wasn't before. Uh, the Constitution, certainly the Constitution is about republicanism, and republicanism does have a certain civic conception of equality, and equality matters to the founders. I don't, I don't think Lincoln's wrong about that basic belief. But at the same time, Lincoln is suggesting that really the federal government needs to take on an active role in promoting equality, even if the states don't necessarily want it to. And this is where the 14th Amendment comes in, right? So I've mentioned this already, but the 14th Amendment, it comes in the wake of Lincoln's presidency after he had died. And this is the amendment that for the first time, the federal government is given a way that it can supervise the states and make sure that they're enforcing life, liberty, and property. Before, it couldn't do that. And it's the 14th Amendment that's been used to used by the Supreme Court, especially to provide more and more expansive views of what equality means and how it's going to be protected. You could argue that Lincoln's view of equality, and I think rightly argue that Lincoln's view of equality is much more restrained than that. I mean, he's not talking about gay marriage. Right. But some critics of Lincoln would say, if you make equality the proposition that America is dedicated to, how do you draw the line? Where do you stop? Um, you know, people will disagree on that, but it's kind of a Pandora's box that you can never really close once you say, this is America, is equality. Okay, 420, so you guys are free to go. You can finish writing that slide if you want, but I'll also post it on a on a bright space for you.